Hey guys, Jeremy here. I'm a member of the preaching team here at CFC. I think most of you know me. Um, Matt's been really busy this week. I know it's hard to see because we don't get a lot of face-to-face -face time with each other, but there is a lot going on at the church right now. And so I was glad to be able to take uh, the sermon off of Matt's plate this week just to give him a little bit of a breather. So um, I'm excited to preach through this passage with you. Uh, it's a really unusual moment. I'm used to being in front of people and uh, not having that feedback is unusual. So I have a sudden appreciation for what Matt does every week in these circumstances and uh, uh, i'm grateful for the grace that i know you guys are going to show me so uh, we're living in this really weird and unusual time and one of the things that i found that i've been grateful for is that i get to spend a lot more time with my kids and it's been this really rewarding but also humbling experience to take on all these extra roles so suddenly i'm a teacher to my kids i have to manage schedules for 24 hours a day for all the kids uh, not to mention that we just had a baby so things are a little hectic in our house so it's been this really weird time um, so one of the things we try to do is generate as much fun as we can in our house we like to have play time um, and one of the things that we did was that with our oldest uh, we decided to start doing some late night movie nights. So after the other kids went to bed, uh, we get to sneak him out of his room and let him know, hey, hey, come, come downstairs, we're going to do something fun. And we started doing movie nights with him. Uh, and we started off by watching the Lord of the Rings movies. Now, Emily and I both love these movies. We always have. Uh, I imagine we always will. Uh, we've tried to go through the series every couple of years. Um, and we're extended cut, folks. We're, we're committing to the 12 hours that is the crazy Lord of the Rings movies. Uh, and we decided that Liam is, is probably old enough, mature enough to join us. And since we get to make the schedules in the morning, we're, we weren't too worried about letting him stay up a couple extra hours. So I know that we're not alone in loving these movies. They're this weird phenomenon. And I know that everybody loves them. Because collectively, the three Lord of the Rings movies won 17 Academy Awards. They made just about $3 billion at the box office. Uh, the series is listed on the American Film Institute's top 100 movies of all time, and that's just the movies. That's not even to mention the books that they're based on. Uh, some of the highest selling books in history, uh, about 150 million copies have been sold. And what I found myself thinking about as I watched my son start to fall in love with this story that I've loved is that I can, strangely enough, tell you the entire plot of The Lord of the Rings in about two seconds. So here it is. The Lord of the Rings, if you're not familiar, is about a group of people trying to take a ring to a volcano. There you go. That doesn't sound like a multi-billion dollar idea, but something about that story resonates with us. And I think what makes the story so powerful is this simple idea of a group of people committed to something that is beyond themselves. A group of people who are committed to the fellowship of brothers that serve a unified purpose. And as we continue in this devoted series, we're going to see that what makes stories like this so impactful is that God has wired into us, into his people, a desire for real fellowship. Now last week, we looked at the call on God's people to be devoted to the apostles' teaching, to be devoted to the word of God. And this week, what we're going to see is that the church is to be devoted to the fellowship. So I want to take a look at what fellowship is. I want to look at what the fellowship looked like for the early church what it looks like for us today, I want to see the results that can come from being devoted to fellowship, and then how we as individuals can devote ourselves to fellowship. So what is fellowship? I think the biggest mistake we make that clouds our understanding of fellowship is that we think of fellowship as a verb. We think fellowship is something we do. We think the gathering of believers in and of itself is fellowship. The catchy Christian term we use is doing life together. So we think, okay, if I'm physically in the same place as other believers, that's fellowship. And there are two problems with that. First, it causes us to miss the actual action that we're called to in Acts 2, which isn't fellowship, it's devotion. We're not given an example of people who were engaging in fellowship, but people who were devoted to the fellowship. The fellowship isn't an action, it's a thing. It's not something we do, but it's who we are. The Greek word Luke uses is koinonia, and it's this word that means an association or a community. It describes this mingling of people together. The secular Greeks use the word to describe the connection people have when they're in deep, authentic friendship, or sometimes even the connection between a husband and a wife. The analogy that comes to mind is, is somebody who is a large shareholder in a company. 
somebody who puts their money into the company and is then suddenly united with all the other shareholders and they have this vested interest in the success of the thing they bought into. Now we are a people who have been brought into this fellowship, but we didn't pay money to get into it. Our interest was bought at the price of the blood of the Son of God. Then through that price we are eternally united into this fellowship. And we're united not only in what we've received, but also in a mission. We're brought into union with Christ so that we might be reconciled to the Father and that we might receive the Holy Spirit. The fellowship is the one people that God has brought to himself through his Son. And when we remember that, it makes the fellowship so much more than enjoying time together at a church potluck or going golfing with a fellow believer. And I'm not saying those things are bad. But when we look at fellowship as something we're part of, then the barbecues and basketball games become something deeper because we see them as an opportunity to connect deeply with those who have already been eternally connected by God. So the fellowship is the union of all believers that's achieved not by us, but by Christ. But then what does it look like to be devoted to the fellowship? I want to answer that first by looking at the early church right after Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. How did this devotion play out? And lucky for us, Luke spells it out really clearly in Acts chapter 2. Starting in verse 44, Luke says, All who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their foods with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. So from that passage, we can see the people committed to the fellowship were marked by five traits. First, they were people who were unhindered by the things of this world. Verse 44 can send chills down the, signs of my, the spines of my free market loving brothers and sisters out there. It says that they were selling their possessions to meet the needs of anyone that had them. Now here in America in particular, we can be a little bit consumeristic. That description of the early church is this elephant in the room that we have to address. So before somebody says I'm a communist and, and, and I'm claiming that anybody who owns property is a heretic, let me say that the Bible is not commanding or even suggesting that you go out and sell everything you own. Now I'm not saying God might not ask that of you. He has explicitly told people to do that in scripture, but not here in Acts. We see through the rest of this book that Christians owned homes, they had property, and even in the record of Ananias and Sapphira, who were struck down for withholding a portion of proceeds from selling their property, Luke doesn't tell us that their sin was keeping property. He doesn't even tell us their sin was keeping money. Their sin was in lying and deceiving the church. So don't think that Luke 2 says that you can't own anything. What Luke 2 says of a true believer is that if we're devoted to the fellowship, it's actually a lot harder than selling everything you have. What the Bible tells us in this passage is you can absolutely own property, but your hands had better be wide open. You get that Rolex, but if a brother is struggling to make rent, you don't skip a beat to sell it. You send your kids to the nice school, but when your neighbor gets the impossible hospital bill, there's no question they go back to the underfoot in public one. And when there are needs that can't be met otherwise, a true believer who's committed to the fellowship puts the for sale sign in their yard because stuff doesn't last. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying your stuff. I don't, I'm not saying don't buy the big TV. I'm not saying don't get a good house. But when we see those that we are knit into fellowship with suffering, who have needs, there should be no question where our priorities lie. And that's gonna bring us right into the second trait of a fellowship devoted believer, which is that they care about the needs of those around them. When Jesus tells the parable of the man who gets robbed and left for dead, the hero is the good Samaritan that does everything in his power to help. But the story has villains. Jesus showed us that the men who claim to be religious and upright before God revealed their hypocrisy in ignoring the need that was placed before them. A person devoted to the fellowship refuses to let needs go unanswered because they can see their brothers and sisters are one with them that they're united in the fellowship. The third trait we see in the early church is that they had hearts of worship and gratitude. Forget Sunday morning, all right? These folks got together every day to attend temple. Then they'd go home, they'd praise in people's homes, and they spent time being grateful that they were able to do so. 
And this makes sense when we see the fellowship through the lens of a people unified in Christ. The idea of missing out on corporate worship, of coming together, should be un as unsettling to us as the idea of losing your sense of smell. Because look, I'm not just me worshiping God. You're not just you worshiping God. We are a people. And when you're not there, we are not whole. So look, we're stuck in quarantine, and, and God's grace has shined in that we have the technology to come together in some form for worship. But if we're going to be honest for a second, I think we can admit that Zoom Church is like the JV middle school team next to the Denver Broncos. Like, yeah, your eighth grader is good for his age, and I'm glad he's playing, but if you put him against Vaughn Miller, that kid's getting laid out. And that's where we're at now. We're getting along by the grace of God, and we should be grateful for what we have. But we know that this is not what it's supposed to be. Because we're only getting a fragment of each other for a few minutes on Sunday. We can do small groups on FaceTime, but honestly, is anybody going to miss when we get to give hugs again? No. The people of God call to worship together as the fellowship long for corporate gathering. And the fourth trait we see in the early church is that they were committed to doing life together. And I know I just knocked that phrase, but the early church did it right. Because they saw each other as a family. They saw that they were, they were unified together. They were knit together in fellowship. I mean, just imagine this. They're going to temple every day together. They're getting together to donate money, to sell property, so they can meet the needs that they see among each other. They have meals together every day. These are not like the, oh, hey, how's it going? Oh, I'm fine, sort of church members. These are people who live fully intertwined because they see themselves as the fellowship. And the final trait we see in these devoted believers is that they are upright to the world outside the church. And this gets into the missional aspect of the fellowship. Imagine a world where Christianity is so new, it barely has a name. The believers are meeting in houses. The rest of the world thinks that their Messiah is dead and buried, and they're described as having favor with all the people. Now, this doesn't just happen, because we have a natural lean toward disliking those we disagree with. I know because I've been on Facebook ever. And look, I'm not saying that a devoted believer will be liked by everyone. There are always going to be opponents to the church who are led by a spiritual enemy that's never going to concede the battle because of our service. But the people of God, led by the Spirit of God, to serve the world around them intentionally, meeting needs, being self-sacrificing, having joy and gratitude, live in a way that the world outside the church looks at them and holds them in high esteem. So those are the traits we see in these, these believers devoted to the fellowship in the early church, but how does it look today? What does a church in 2020 devoted to the fellowship look like? Well, the answer is simple. It should look exactly like the church did after Pentecost. We should be the people who hold our possessions with an open hand, who look for the opportunities to give sacrificially, to meet the needs of those around us. In order to meet those needs, we need to be plugged into the lives of our brothers and sisters in Christ, plugged in enough to see those needs and then also share our own needs. That unity and living should lead to a desire to worship with one another, both on Sunday mornings and beyond, and to be grateful for the gracious gift that worship is. And all of that should overflow to a love of the world around us and a drive to serve that world in a way that draws them to esteem the church and seek out the God that leads us in that service. And we don't do any of this in vain. We don't devote ourselves to the fellowship with no result. Our God is a God who accomplishes, and in creating a people, he gets results. So what are the results we should expect to see as a people devoted to the fellowship? Well, we find the answer to that in Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 shows us that the elders and the teachers of the church work to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. To put it another way, they equip the fellowship to work on mission. And what does Paul tell us happens when the fellowship is equipped and is serving? First, we see that God brings unity to his people. Now, here's the thing. I'm not Caleb Cheshire, and Caleb isn't Bob Schutzis. My wife isn't Julie Monks, and Julie isn't Karen Ray. We're each individuals. We each have strengths, and we each have weaknesses. 
but just like my inner ear can't propel my body forward and my leg muscles can't see what's around me and my brain can't keep my body upright and my core muscles can't make sense of information, my eyes can't create a sense of balance, when every individual part works together to serve its individual purpose, the system works together to do one job. And that's the fellowship. It's individuals working together to accomplish one goal. And that one goal, the glorification of the God of the universe, is the thing that unifies us. When we look at the, the fellowship from a distance, we don't see all the individual pieces. We see one mission being accomplished. The best illustration that comes to mind is a photo mosaic portrait. It's one of those pictures where you have hundreds or thousands of individual distinct pictures that if you look at them closely, they're their own thing and they have nothing to do with each other. But when you put them all together, they make one perfectly clear image. Another result of our devotion to the fellowship is our growing in knowledge of Christ. The most educated of us doesn't know everything, and our gaps in knowledge and understanding are often invisible to us. One of my favorite TV shows is The IT Crowd. It's about these three people who work in the IT department of a huge company. In one episode, uh, one of the characters says that they feel like they shouldn't be holding somebody up on a pedal stool. And it's this funny gag, because you expect everyone to know that the phrase is that you hold somebody up on a pedestal. But here's the thing. We all do that. We all have these gaps, and we don't realize we have them. And sometimes they're funny, and sometimes they're silly, but sometimes they're dangerous, especially when it comes to our understanding of God. Some of the great heresies in our history come from people spreading misinformation and not being checked by other believers. And it's also really obvious today when the mantra of the world tends to be that God is whatever I define God to be. And we all fall into this trap, too. We say things like, oh, I don't believe God would do that, or my God wouldn't have a problem with that behavior. Because what we often try to do is create this comprehensive knowledge of who God is all on our own. But Paul is showing us that a full knowledge of Christ, a full knowledge of God, comes from the fellowship. It comes from the body. This is also why, as Matt showed us last week, it's so important to be devoted to the Word of God. Because when we create a theology in isolation, we're less likely to come to a knowledge of God as we are to create a God that looks and sounds exactly like us. We're prone, as Paul puts it, to be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. But a devotion to the fellowship will allow us to fill our knowledge gaps with the knowledge of other Bible-loving believers so that we may come to a true knowledge of the Son of God. And finally, when we're devoted to the fellowship, Paul says that we attain the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That means really simply that as we devote ourselves to the body of Christ, we become more like Christ. It's why Solomon tells us iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. If we're not plugged into the body, we're just a sword banging on a tree getting duller and duller. And God didn't call us to that. When we joyfully live our lives in a Christ-like way, we show the world the glory of Christ. And when we are devoted to the fellowship, we will be driven to live like Christ. We should be challenged by the people around us, and we should challenge them. We should celebrate our victories and our growth, and we should confess and repent our failures. But we can't do that in isolation. Now, I can be my own worst critic, but without someone to hold me accountable, I will never be a wildly different person than I am today. And I know that's true because I'm married, all right? Jeremy, 15 years ago, is an idiot and a slob. But because my wife pushes against me, because she challenged me, challenges me, today I can say that I'm an idiot and a little bit less of a slob. And that's sort of a joke, but that's the fellowship. We're all this mess, and we help each other to get cleaner through God's grace and we're never going to be perfect on this side of glory, but we push each other toward godliness. And the world sees the glory of God when we lay our failures at the cross in humility and when we give God the glory for every step we take in the right direction. So how do we devote ourselves to the fellowship today? So Matt threw me a curveball with this passage because we're living in a really weird time to think about the fellowship. We're scattered, we're isolated. But at the end of the day, I'm really glad I get to talk about this. 
because everybody who's here today understands really deeply that we need the fellowship. We need each other. We don't work in isolation. I'm an introvert, full end of the spectrum, and I am ready to be done with this way of life. So I don't feel like I need to sell anybody on the value of being devoted to the fellowship. But how do we engage the fellowship in a time like this? I want to give you two things today. Because every week in this series, we want to give you a challenge, something to work toward over the week. Last week, Matt challenged us to be in our Bibles every day. And look, keep at that. Whether you crushed it and you spent an hour in your Bible for seven days, or whether your Bible just has an extra seven days of dust on it, but God is gracious. He's going to bless your time in the Word. Keep devoting yourself to His Word. But this week, the two ways I want to challenge us to be devoted to the fellowship are, are first, I want you to take 15, 20, 30 minutes. I want you to set aside an actual chunk of time, and I want you to reflect on how God has wired you and how you can function, how you can equip, how you can serve the body. The Bible tells us we are all different parts of one body. I don't work the same way that you do, my wife doesn't work like I do, and my boys are all wired differently. So commit some time to meditate and pray over how God has called you to be a part of this body. And the second thing I want you to do is find somebody else, find another believer, whether they're a CFC member or not, and ask them, tell them what's on your heart and ask them to tell you if they see it. Because sometimes we don't think we're capable of certain things. We think that we're not gifted in certain ways, and we're just wrong. Or sometimes we think we're really gifted in one area, and we're just wrong. But if we look for some accountability from someone who cares about us, someone who has our best interest at heart, they can help us see where we have clarity and where our judgment may be a little clouded. So that's my challenge to you this week. Let's press on together as one unified body. Let's see how God has led us to be devoted to the fellowship. Look, I love you guys. I can't wait to get together and shake hands and hug again. Um, and in this time that's difficult, uh, I, I pray that everyone uh, can get a sense of the value of being devoted to the fellowship. And let's work towards that this week. Um, let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. We know that you're a God who has not left us. In dark times and difficult times, we know that you are still with us. And you're with us as the body, Lord. We thank you for this fellowship. We thank you for a people that you have made, that you have bought with the blood of your son, that you reconciled to yourself. We thank you for that precious gift. We ask that we would have a heart devoted to the fellowship, that we wouldn't see fellowship as just a simple thing we do, but a people who we are. And in light of the fact that we have already been knit into that fellowship, Lord, show us how it is that we are gifted to serve one another. Let us meet the needs of each other. Let us give sacrificially. Let us love. Let us be grateful. Let us worship. Let us be the fellowship that you have called us to be. It is by your grace, gracious and beautiful name we pray. Amen.